my name is Debbie Katz and I'm a felt artist. I uh, create a variety of objects with felted wool, uh, ranging from functional tea cozies and um, slippers to fanciful felted birds and roosters, um, fish, sculptural pieces. Um, I've been a felt artist for the past 12 years and have um, no formal training in the practice. Um, so everything that I have gathered that I bring to my practice, I have, I have gathered within the last 12 years. And I could say more about where that has come from. Um, my teaching, um, uh, the, the learning that I've done has come from, from some fantastic teachers who are international felt makers. Uh, one in particular, her name is Fiona Duthie. She lives on, on Salt Spring Island and she has uh, offered um, incredible support to the felting community for, for several years. And um, I have taken, I think, six or seven online felting courses with her and also attended uh, symposiums and felting retreats. So basically I, I, will, I will take anything offered when it comes from Fiona and um, a couple of other um, high-end felting teachers. Uh, Salt Spring Island happens to have five different uh, women who are, I would say, professional felters. Um, Ulrike Benner, um, uh, the name of the woman I took courses with a few summers ago escapes me, um, but it may come back. Uh, and uh, as well, teachers who are some in Australia, some in Ireland, and one course I'm taking actually in a couple of weeks comes from Paris, France, um, doing a very fancy hat making class. My inspiration, really, you know, I, I thought about this question and this, the possibilities for the, the, the answers. And um, certainly I, I find the unknown, like the unspoken, uh, un, 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 unseen, um, almost like a dream. It's not like I'm waiting for the muse, but my inspiration does come from sometimes a strong sense of I'm going to make a whole bunch of fish and make them look like they're struggling for their survival because um, uh, that, that, that is an idea that's very current and, and present in me. And, and so here I go. The actual um, inspiration may have come from reading, from seeing something on the internet, uh, from talking to people. Um, I, I mean, I do find myself surrounded by incredible coastal influences, whether it's the sea fog, the smoke in the air, the trees, the water, um, all quietly have provoke um, uh, pieces that I've done over the years. Um, within the within my practice itself, I seem to like to make multiples of things. So many fish, many flowers, um, many vessels, not really um, uh, sure about why that is, but I think the repetition is something that appeals to me. Um, I, I think I began getting into felt making because I had a, a, a background in knitting like many of us of my age, my mother was responsible for teaching me how to knit, which is just an incredibly soothing and, and, and repetitive um, practice. So I'm not sure if some of that hasn't carried over. Um, one of the things that I think influenced me and continues to is like the sense of possibility when I was, um, uh, I was an elementary school special ed teacher for about 30 years and Really, if you're an artist, that's a great place to be, an elementary school classroom. There is so much, it's like a raw canvas, especially in an elementary classroom where you can create um, entire installations that will cover science, art, 
literature, um, mathematics, basically the whole curriculum. I remember w one uh, major project we did called the Dinosaurs Last Waltz, and we had teaching assistants and um, all kinds of people helping build these gigantic um, papier mache dinosaurs. And the kids were able to, you know, create any number of um, exciting and, 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 and real projects to go with their dinosaurs. So then I began to see, you know, the connectedness. I think that's where I, I, I derive a lot of, of pleasure if I can connect the, the salmon to what's currently happening now to the orcas that like right out in front of my house, the orcas do come by on occasion, but they don't very often now because the salmon aren't running. And so some part of me does feel that there is a connection that I've made a connection there. Um, yeah, my strong s desire to create also comes from the physicality of making a piece, whether it's a hat or a um, series of vessels, uh, the pleasure of working with the wool, the water, the soap, it's so elemental. There's really nothing more required than some good wool, some water and some soap. <clears throat> bubble wrap, some friction. Uh, so the simplicity is, is also very desirable. Things can get really complicated when you add silk and beadwork and more in interesting finishing touches. Uh, but I think that's all I can really say about my, my, my inspiration. It's not, it's not some great mysterious force that comes to meet me in the night. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really easy answer for me. Um, uh, recently, about a year ago, actually, 24 women were chosen by lottery to join Fiona Duthie on Gambier Island, which is not far from Bowen Island. And if there's nothing on the island except a, a summer camp. And so for five days, these women from all over the world met and had the opportunity to share practices with each other. And 15 of these 24 women were actually teaching mini workshops. So they were maybe an hour long and we would do it and then we would learn how to dye silk in mason jars in a way that we had never thought of doing before. Um, with really interesting things. We, um, worked like crazy hours, you know, from six in the morning until six at night and then carried on in the evening if, if there was any energy left. But at the end of that, these women um, stayed so much in touch. And, you know, there's some really good things about the internet, that being one of them. So we continue to stay in touch. We, we create pieces, we put it online, we send it out, we get a lot of feedback. And, um, the other uh, umbrella that connects me to my fellow felt makers is through a group called felt futra futra being the french word for felt this is a canadian organization that um, uh, collectively promotes and and um, you know provides a platform for uh, a seminar or a symposium that's held every three years um, one side of the country. The last one was in Nova Scotia. The one that was to have happened this summer and couldn't was in to be in Red Deer, Alberta. And that's a week-long um, gathering of, again, about 300 felt makers who come to do workshops and learn with each other. So those connections are strongly made and, um, and really important in, in continuing the practice Within my own community right here on Pender Island, um, there are a few felt makers, but I think my place in the community, I feel quite strongly as an artist. There are a few galleries that I exhibit at here. Um, I offer workshops to children and adults. And so I think my, yeah, I feel, I feel that my practice 
uh, really defines who I am some days. Absolutely. Um, you may not know, but um, I can tell you a little bit about felt making in that it, it began that many thousands of years ago when itinerant uh, tribes in Uzbekistan and um, the, Mon the Mongolian people used their yak yaks fur to make felt. And, and, and there's a fabulous video if you Googled um, or looked it up on felt making. So the entire village gathers the yak fur and they spread it out on a huge like football field and they stomp on it with uh, some kind of maybe even butter, I don't know, water, some, something to, to start the felt compressing or the wool compressing. And they do that for a long, long day. And then when it sort of starts to firm up, they roll it up in, on, a, on top of a big barrel kind of thing. And then a horse drags this piece of wool up and down the field for like, and when all is said and done, they have created a wall for a new building, a yurt. Strictly portable, um, uh, weatherproof, like practically waterproof and made, you know, entirely from their animals. So that's one early, early, uh, very traditional use of felt. And the other is coming from women in Afghanistan and um, the countries in that part of the world who have formed a collective and have been making felt slippers, felt bags, felt beads, felt adornments um, as part of their own costumes for that many years as well. So that was like thousands of years ago. Now um, the traditional methods are still carried forth. And in Europe, especially in Scandinavia, some of the, even in France and in Austria and in Germany, felt making also has a, has a much longer history than it does in Canada. And it's at this point seen as a very, um, in some places, certainly as a kind of haute couture, you know, it is, is high end fashion. Yeah. Uh, so yes, it's been long used as, as, as a source of shelter and clothing. And um, I think continues to be. Really, I don't, I don't have to resist it because <laughs> There's very little, aside from one piece of machinery I'll tell you about, that would um, influence the work I do. So I use water, wool, soap, and friction. There is a machine called a roller, which some women who have either arthritis in their hands or some difficulties in using their body, because it can be quite physical and quite long, if you're making a really big piece or a very strong bag, you're going to be rolling and thumping and working hard at it for hours. So the, the roller would allow you to um, really abbreviate that physical use of your, mm -hmm. of your own body. But at this point, I don't require that. Um, usually the, 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 the practices, the new things that come my way are um, actually old, like a finding a source for marjolaine silk, which is a very old fashioned kind of silk. Um, the new practices that I see, uh, or practices that I see some of my colleagues using, they're, they're shared, they're not necessarily new. Uh, they're not technologically advanced. Uh, but I think the remarkable thing about technology that has has that I have welcomed and certainly have been turned against is the use of of online teaching and how um, remarkable it is that something so tactile and so um, that you know we're reliant so much on our hands um, is so teachable uh, with a good teacher who can say 
uh, what she might want to say after you have shared that, if that the work you've done and she'll say, oh, I see what happened. You didn't do this or you didn't do that or your layout was uneven. And so, yeah, bring it on. Uh, I was born in northern New Brunswick, which is um, a very, I would say, uh, non- uh, what can I say? Northern New Brunswick was a, a, a fishing, mining, logging um, part of the world, very cold in the winter. If anything, um, and I spent a lot of time in, New, in Nova Scotia as well, and found that there was uh, a, a really fiber rich um, culture, weaving, knitting, spinning, um, those kinds of hand crafts were emphasized were available and my sister and I both spent a lot of time in that part of the world and we um, went to university there and we spent as much time as we could you know buying wool knitting um, coming to going to markets um, and I think Nova Scotia and New Brunswick both um, are known for that aspect of their you know that the handicrafts are very very integral and one thing in New Brunswick that is, isn't so prevalent out here in New Brunswick there are a lot of rug hookers um, which is um, just something that happens to be valued and and done there quite quite extensively so that yeah I moved to Montreal um, after school and I didn't really have much to do with the arts and craft culture there. I had started my teaching career, um, but I was always interested in knitting. On Vancouver Island, about two years ago, a group of, of uh, sheep farmers and wool people began something called the Wool Fold, where the entire um, progress of the sheep from its time on the farm to its being sh shorn and then the, the fleece would be taken to the to the woolen mill and it would be processed and cleaned and and prepared for either felting or spinning or knitting um, so that it, it one big you know picture where everything is done um, to promote the, 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 the use of, of the sheep instead of, as most of my wool comes from New Zealand. Most of my wool arrives here beautifully dyed, ready to felt with no, um, uh, you know, n nothing that I have to add to it. However, whenever I can get my hands on local wool, which I can, there's quite a few sheep farms on Pender Island, mm -hmm. I, I do. And I'm able to make use of that wool, even, it, even though it's not as processed in some of the work I do. So at Christmas time, I make all these crazy looking little gnomes and their bodies are made with core wool. It's not bad wool, it's just not as easy to felt with. You could roll it and rub it and pound it for hours and nothing would really change. <laughs> so I do make use of that wool um, here and uh, other aspects of, of the BC geography I kind of alluded to um, just being surrounded by the water, by the forest, by this coastal ruggedness um, definitely has influenced me. Um, not directly, but indirectly, yeah. I've been very fortunate to have um, a good connection with Craft Council BC down on Granville Island. And so I've seen that work, which I think is a really good example of what goes on in BC as in terms of arts and culture. And um, also I participated in lots of the Sydney Fine Arts Show and the Souk Fine Arts Show. So my exposure to art in 
in, in um, a variety of art forms has been fairly extensive. And would I know that it was BC art if I didn't know I was in BC? <laughs> I don't really know. I know it well. I see, I've seen it for the past 12 years since I've participated in these uh, competitions. There's a lot of vibrancy that I see, but I'm always looking for color. I'm always looking for the strong marks, um, the, the, uh, not the subdued pastels. Um, in terms of my work as a felt maker, is there a distinctive BC um, look? Uh, again, I, I would say not that I know, not that I have seen in particular. There's people, friends of mine in Southern California who are creating pieces that look like something I would make. And I think more than um, the geographical location, um, it could be that our teachers that we share have influenced us. Uh, when I first considered entering this competition, the personal geography um, and, and personal and material geographies, I went down to the beach and um, I found these remarkable um, marks that the the ocean had caused or the glaciers or something and there were these strong strong marks on on a whole number of rocks and I started making rubbings of them hoping that I would be able to incorporate them into a, a pretty complicated process where you you use um, uh, a, a photogenic uh, practice where you take a picture of the rubbing um, and then transfer it onto cloth, onto a, a piece of felted wool. Cairo practice, chirogenics, I think it's called. So you take, you, you, you put the, the cloth in a completely dark place. You've, you've put um, the chemical on the cloth you put the cloth that has this chemical on it in a completely dark place. And then the design that you have um, uh, put on to the, the, the cloth is, is then put onto the cloth. As well. This is a terrible explanation. It's a good <laughs> thing about teaching this. Anyhow, that being said, I couldn't get it to work and I really wanted it to, um, to be, you know, that connection between this really this rock and me and the beach and the geography, but it didn't, it didn't, uh, I, I wasn't able to do it. So then I came back to the fish 